Let's start with Thomas Harding of MLB.com to talk about the Rockies bringing back Walt Weiss, the manager. Thomas, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. Are you surprised by this move? Because we weren't quite sure about the relationship between the new general manager, Jeff Breidich, and the owner, Walt Weiss, who will be going into his fourth season. Are you surprised by this at all that he's coming back? I wouldn't say that I'm surprised, but because I went into it as uh, I think we discussed when I was down there on the air, I just wasn't sure what they were going to do, to be honest with you. Um, Jeff doesn't put his cards out there, so I really didn't know what was going to happen with this. Um, with, with, and when you look at the Rocky situation, though, Jeff Wright is promoted from within. Um, Walt Weiss had been with the organization. I think there's a certain comfort level believing that people who have been here will get it done now, whether you know, the public agrees with that or not. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> but um, when I was looking around at the available candidates or people that were looking for managerial jobs, I didn't see anybody that had any ties to anyone with the Rockies. And I'll just go back to really cutting through everything else. They're losing because they haven't pitched. It's not because the managers managed them in the hole in the ground. It's that they haven't pitched. So they've got to figure out a way to fix this. Um, we can't have more of the same old, same old in the future. I mean, something's got to something's got to give. They got to figure out a way to pitch competently enough to let their other strengths come th come true. Uh, Thomas, d do you think Jeff Breidich said to himself? and Dick Monford, because I'm sure he was in on this decision as well. Do you think they said to themselves, you know, we really haven't given Walt Weiss an opportunity to succeed? There have been a lot of injuries in his three years here. Uh, the pitching staff, as you said, needs to drastically improve. Do you, think, um, do you think they showed a little bit of compassion, a little bit of empathy for what Walt Weiss has gone through as the manager the last few years? Um, I think that's part of it. Um, they, they looked at the job that he did and... I'm going to guess, because I wasn't involved in this, I'm going to guess they looked at what he did, evaluated what he did, and didn't see where he was the problem with his team. Um, there, there, there have been a lot of things that have gone wrong, but if you look at, say, September, their last road trip, they did pretty well on that. The last homestand, they... They were swept by the Pirates, but it was because the Pirates were that much better than them. They ended up sweeping the Dodgers. Um, <laughs> they didn't play great on the road, but... I think the sense was that the guys continue to play for Walt, so they're going to um, give this another shot here. Now, the questions that I have are, what are they going to do with the roster? Um, are, are they going to make any really big trades? Uh, can they hold on to cargo and keep the lineup as it is and still get the pitching they need? Or are they going to just expect the pitching that they have to get better? Um, and, and the last thing that I have, and maybe the biggest thing, is there an extension on the horizon for Walt Weiss? Thomas, at the beginning of the season, when Breidich was named the general manager, we got the impression, at least I got the impression, that this would be a two-headed monster somewhat, that Breidich would be leaning on Walt Weiss heavily for personnel uh, advice. They would make some personnel decisions together. I don't know that that's still the case. How involved do you think Walt Weiss will be with Jeff Breidich going forward when it comes to determining the makeup of the 25-man roster? I believe that that is something that's going to have to be discussed, and I would imagine it came up yesterday. During the offseason last year, I thought that those two were very much on the same page. Um, and, and, and if you look at the, at the roster, it reflected Weiss's view that if the pitching came together, then this could be a team that could surprise. I mean, why else do you go out and you sign not just John Axford, but a, bit, but a bench player like Daniel Descalzo, where you know his contributions would be... Really, like like this season, they were meaningless here, but if he were playing on a winning team, those four or five games that maybe the two or three that he won for you would be huge. So I, I don't know if during the season the evaluation of the roster, the um, evaluation of where the thing was heading, I don't know that they were on the same page. I'm not saying they weren't. I just didn't sense that, um, like you talked about, the togetherness um, that you saw in the off season. Now, the question, like I say, the question is, what are they going to do to make 2016 better? Because when I look at that lineup of theirs, I cannot see them saying, okay, we're just going to wait on these pitchers. Some of them will come now, some of them will come in one year, some in two years, because you've got cargo through 2017. You do have Arenado through, what, 2020 or 2019? I can't remember which one it is. But how do you... 
how do you make this thing better now? Because I'm looking at the Houston Astros. While their their pitching grew up at once, but they went out and got veteran bullpen help, and that's as big a reason as anything why they're where they are now. Can the Rockies make that quantum leap with the pitching? Thomas, um, you're in that clubhouse almost every day. I'm there quite a bit as well. Uh, I don't think either one of us heard much grumbling from the players about Walt Weiss. In fact, I, I think I got the impression they're very happy to play for him. Is that an accurate portrayal of that clubhouse and the players' relationship with the manager? They are happy to play for Walt Weiss. They're happy to play with each other. Listen, they were happy with Troy Tulowitzki because they realized that he was a guy when he was there that really helped guys as they came into the majors learn what the majors were all about. They're in pretty good shape in a lot of ways, but if you talk to everybody, um, I would say maybe 80% or more are saying, get us a picture and get us a picture yesterday. I think there are people with the organization, um, on the staff, in the front office, who believe that uh, the pitching that they have, especially with Chad Bettis coming on the way he did, and they're hoping that someone else, whether it's Hoffman they got in the Blue Jays trade, or John Gray will take that step forward, that they can be competitive even if they don't spend the big money. But most people will tell you, they're just like, please, just get us, get us a pitcher, somebody to put ahead of Jorge De La Rosa, who's been very good for them, but to put ahead of De La Rosa in the rotation where when John Gray is pitching in a game, he can actually, um, after the game, look, when, when he's not, I'm sorry, when he's not pitching, he could look at whoever it is, whether it's a David Price or whoever, and say, hey, this guy did it. He did it at Coors Field. I can do it just like this. Thomas, this is Woody, and I, I stepped in late, but you mentioned Houston, which is interesting because I've heard rumblings around here. Well, follow the Houston blueprint. Well, the Houston blueprint is exactly what other winning teams' blueprint is. They developed some players. They drafted some players, and they went out and got big money players. So, I mean, the two guys who hit home runs last, last night weren't with the team last year. So, I mean, for people to sit and say, oh, the way to do it is, oh, look at Kansas City. Well, they went and got David Price. So I just would say, Thomas, and I agree with you, that, that unless you go get a big-time pitcher, you're always going to be stuck in the mud. Well, if you look at Houston, actually, what they did, they, they made the signings, um, of the veteran players, really kind of lower echelon players in the offseason. They did trade for Arietta a few years ago, but he was one of those young guys they brought up. The starting pitching was more youth and development or acquire young guys that are, that are pretty good. The, the issue that I have with, say, do what Houston did, Houston completely tore down their franchise. Yeah, they burnt teams. it to the ground. But yeah. the Rockies don't have to do that because if you look at the record for the last four or five years, that's exactly what they've done. They, they, they've had a bad record. Now, their record wasn't that they just tore down the franchise and decided we were going to go with all rookies. Their problem was the pitching. If you gave any of those teams decent pitching, I would say that any of the last four or five teams were contenders here. So the, so the Rockies, they don't have to take those steps back that Houston did. Now, what you brought up, let's look at the Kansas City Royals, okay? Last, when they were one of those young teams with a lot of good parts, like we talked about with the Rockies, then they went out and traded for James Shields and put him at the front of the rotation. And that pushed them forward. This year... Um, yeah, they didn't have shields, but when they needed another pitcher, you know, they made the trade for Johnny Cueto. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yes, get that guy at the front of the rotation, but, the guy who's better than the guys that you have, and I think it makes those other guys better. But, Tom, and I was thinking about this last night. Let's say that the Rockies get off to a good start next year. They, they've got the foundation there at third base, at second base, maybe at first. We don't know. Uh, they, they made a good choice in, in catchers. They've got uh, the outfield's two, pretty three. well set. Yeah. Yeah. But let's say that this team gets off to a good start next year and goes into May and June, and they've been in that position. You know that, Thomas. You've been around this team. They've been there, but instead of going and get a Cueto or a David Price or Shields, they go get Big Court. Uh, that was the last time they were actually a factor. They're just not willing to to spend the money, and and it just keeps coming back to me that. You, that if you want to keep around Jose Reyes at $22 million, that is almost a quarter of your franchise f price. I mean, a franchise a payroll, yeah, $100 million. Yeah. Really? 
I mean, I can understand it with Tula whiskey. I can understand it with cargo, but I don't understand it with Reyes. And they're going to have to eat that money. But is this team going to be willing to say, go into the next year at $100 million, which, which seems to be the going rate that Dick Monfer will pay, and they get into June and they have, you know, Chad Bettis pitching well and De La Rosa squeezes another year out of his arm. Are they a team that will ever go and get Shields or get Price or get Cueto? That's what I don't see. I don't right. see it ever happening. Well, I don't see that happening. However, I'm not sure that you wait on that because let, let's look at this year, okay? Through April, they were in pretty good shape. Um, the, before the 11-game losing streak, they were in pretty good shape. Then that losing streak completely blew up everything. I mean, they were – if they had continued to play in the May and maybe into June the way they played in April, then – they could have. Then we could have seen if Jeff Brightish could have pulled off the big deal to get the front line pitcher in here. So if you're going to get a a leader of the rotation in, it has to be done this off season, not wait till the season. But you know, you know as well as I do, they're not going to do that. They're not going to give up because I mean, I remember Dick Monford saying to me, "Everybody calls about Arenado. Everybody calls about." Rosario, we're not going to give up those guys. Well, they got went 50-50 on those two guys, but they're just not. They're so proud of their people, and you know as well as I do, Thomas. And I, I'll stop writing. You're the guest, but they pay attention to a to a couple of magazines that rate their farm system so high. When you and I know who is writing those stories, Forgive here's me. the deal. Here, okay, let, let me <laughs> let, let me let me hit you with this, okay? Because there's a new GM in here. And this is what I believe can happen. Number one, you do have to move Reyes. However, you're going to be stuck with a lot of that money. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, if you still had Tulowitzki, it's still the same thing. So to me, it's a wash. You move him, maybe you don't get much for him. Or, or I say, maybe you move him and you package a Trevor Story or a David Dahl. This is the time to move some of those prospects. The re- I, I, I don't argue with the fact that they're rated highly as prospects, but if you look at um, the Cardinals over the years, they don't do it as much now as they did uh, years ago when LaRusso was around. They had highly rated farm systems, and they tended to trade those guys for the big piece that they needed. Do, now, do the Rockies necessarily need David Price to sign him for, you know, $200 million on, a, on a free agent market? No. They may need just somebody a little bit below that. What they don't need is to go out and get, say, a Kendrick back of the rotation, um, can't really pitch on the Phillies. That's what they don't need. So what they're going to have to do, I believe, is they need to make some smart signings. Like I say, no. sign someone better than well, Kendrick. And if you're going to trade, trade some of those assets in your minor league system. Uh, Thomas, really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll be reading it at MLB.com, all right? Thank you very much. All right, that's Thomas Harding. And that segment was brought to you by a new sponsor of ours, Golf Aurora. And, yeah, we're going to talk about golfing in the fall because it's so beautiful around here. It's a gorgeous time of the year to hit the city of Aurora golf courses. They've got a lot of them. And at GolfAurora.com, you can now reserve your fall game on six different beautiful courses. So choose from championship layouts all the way to an 18-hole executive course. It's all there for you. All are open to the public at a great value. It's GolfAurora.com.